hopefully you guys can hear me well. I'll let you get all settled down. First, I'd like to thank the, the library for sponsoring these type of events. Can, can you hear me in the back okay? Just to make sure I, um, I represent the Wild Rivers Dowdy Society. We're a local society here in town. And we started it about six years ago, it was, and I have a little more information on that. So, we want to discuss about dahlias. It's a big passion and thing, and it's a great area to go for there. Uh, one thing it is, is that I've always noticed and mentioned in the past is that when I have values, values always come up with a story. And what's the story? I go to see, talk to people, and say something that is here on my phone or flowers, and then I said dahlias. And then they go and say, oh, dahlias, I remember when I was a kid. <laughs> and then there's a grandma, grandpa, aunt, or uncle to do that. And they, so my story, here's my story, what I got here to do this thing. So I had one. It started in 1964 as a little kid. Do that, and palms are my favorite, those little guys, and everybody seems like palms when they're first to do that. Um, we had family trips in the station wagons, they were full of blooms, early morning, driving from the Bay Area up to Sacramento in sweltering heat, so we didn't ruin the blooms, but the kids almost died on the way up there. <laughs> so, started doing competitive exhibitions in 2001, I think I can see it, that part of my classes were working. I began hybridizing back in 2009. Um, and I now have 26 named varieties that are in the book named to do that. So they have to go through a process. It's, it's a long process. It's four to five years. You got to get it in. You have to win so many awards. You have to pass the bench. And that's all more detailed stuff. And then you get it in to do that. Currently, I'm certified as a senior judge, a seating judge, and an instructor. I'm president and founding member of the Wild Rivers Dowdy Society and the American Dowdy Society's ambassadors, whether it's vice president in the PNDC, and of course in the judging committee, so we have a lot of this information. So that way you understand I'm just not somebody that just grows them in the garden, there's nothing wrong with that, but there is something behind it to do that, and yet I don't know everything yet still. So, <laughs> so the ADS is our parent, parent organization, the American Dowdy Society. And I'll just kind of run through these things so we can get some more information. But we're, right now, we're at, it's, it's 104 years old is where we're at. So it's one of the longest running organizations, the gardening organizations that there is. Um, another thing about values that you'll see to do this is that there's also, when, you, when I get this a lot, can you tell me what this is? And I go, well, there's only 50,000 named varieties, so I'll take a guess. So you try to guess what's in your area. Our Pacific North of Dally Conference encompasses, we have the Wild River Dally Site, which is us here, we're the southernmost, right up to Namanayo, I always forget that one wrong, they do that up in Canada, they're the farthest one with Victoria, but we've got Portland and uh, Lane County and Douglas County. Uh, so here we, we formed in 2012, we did a, an exhibition show over here at the um, Forestry Building, it was just Bring the blues. It was, it was uh, the, the exhibitors I brought around were the, the people who were the best as exhibitors that were there at the time, best in design, best in horticulture, and best in baskets. And it kind of got it all seated here to do that. Um, so we are, as a part of the organization, is, is dedicated to the expansion of the Dahlia culture. And there's a, 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 recently I had Facebook, got on Facebook, then we had a chat thing going on. What we'd like to see, and a lot of the comments were about people in Dahlia clubs, in the clubs, the garden people felt that they weren't quite as important as the show people. And to me, that's, that's, that's the whole thing is just important. We're all part of the same culture. So what we do and teach helps you in the garden for exhibition or helps you in the garden for, for uh, just to enjoy it when you're going around and do that. So we have a lot of things in Dahlia's and it's the thing that's Different colors, you see different varieties. These are all dahlias. They're all different sized dahlias. And we'll get more into that. So the club where we have topics, and I'll, I'll, if you don't mind, I'll sit down so I can see this a little bit easier to do that. And I figure we'll see be spending time looking at the screen, not me, hopefully. That would be great. So what we have here is the, uh, what we do for the clubs and discussions and stuff. We have the terminologies, of, and we talk about planting out, and we talk about how it's spread up with these, the, the petals, people call petals, when we describe the bloom, what it is, the florets. Um, one thing about the dahlia stuff, when you look at the thing, it's not a flower, it's a bloom. 
Uh, and the difference is, is a, a blue of each one of those florets that you see can produce another plant in a variety. So that's why it's a bloom. So it's, it's a collection of flowers, a collection of florets, and that's what, how you get that definition. So everybody asks that Dahlia's a different girl, I can't grow them, I can kill them. Rosie says she can't grow anything, so we'll, be okay. <laughs> we'll figure it out to see. Right, right. But not really in most cases, it, it really depends. And I always tell, tell people they are the most difficult thing and the easiest thing to grow. And easiest comes in this case, I had a retainer wall fall down, we had the tractor clean it up, put the retainer wall, come back out, and then the next season I see in this Dahlia growing outside the fence all by itself and just appeared. And it stayed there for three years. I didn't water it, didn't feed it, didn't do anything, and it kept coming back. So there, it's not, not a big thing. One thing is a big thing going on now is that they're very bee friendly. So the blooms will run through October here. I mean, I even have blooms in November to do that. So you can see they like, especially if you get these open centered values that we have here, they tend to draw the bees in like crazy. Uh, I walk through my garden out there and I feel like I'm in a hailstorm sometimes because you get a hit. So it's very positive and I already have bees coming in looking for stuff right now. So they're ready to go. So I don't know if anybody knows what the number one secret about growing dahlias are. Can you hint to do that? It's, it's very simple, I tell you. It's just don't tell a whole lot of people. You know, we want to keep it a thing, but it's just time. So it's the more time you spend, the better it is. And that's stuff we teach you at the club. The, in the details, we have a hands-on garden. We meet over at the Bethany Lutheran Church. We have a demonstration garden down there. So what we do is we have a classroom discussion when things are growing and we go out there afterwards and we can do a hands-on experience. Um, so, and, and that's what I said, that's what, when they say talking to your plants, you know, it makes them grow better. No, they don't. It means you're out there seeing what's going on. So that's kind of what it is. So you don't have to think you're weird by talking to your plants. You can just look at them. The, the needs and consideration dahlias for dahlias for the most part they prefer full sunlight so uh, you need about six to eight hours of full sun direct sunlight they can get partial shade uh, if, if you have a choice to do it you prefer to shade in the evening instead of the, in the morning they, they kind of like that it helps them wake up they will go to sleep and they come back over so we'll go over the different types of dyes and things and then afterwards we'll do get in the overview, we'll get into the more of the stuff about what we need for planting nutrients and how we do that. When we get done to this part here is that we'll go through and we'll have a uh, digging, I mean a dividing demonstration. We brought some tubers here. So dahlias, they have 20 different types of um, long pair of glasses. Now I got the right pair. So they got 20 different types of forms, what we call them, to do that. There's nine different size classes on there. They run anything from the size of a quarter up to about 16 inches across. We have 16 different color classes, so there's a lot of variety and they're all still a dahlia. And it was, it was hopefully we guys would come and invite down to the fair and you'll see the fair where we have stuff going on there. We were doing that. Um, we've also adjusted the fair book to make it easier to enter your dahlias if you want to do, get inside there to do that. So we go over the sizes. So we have the sizes of what we call AA, or it's, it's over 10 inches, or giant, that's what the European style for it's called. And then we have the, the, uh, the A size, and it goes right on down to the brand new variety that we finally got in the books, and Akai was pushing for them to get done, and everybody else kind of pushed for it to start to get done, is that we came up with the ADS developed the micro system. So these are the last one, they're under two inches. So you'll get blooms that we have there, they're full blooms that you'll see like this, and it'll be under two inches. So it'll be the micro classes to do that. So the different types of dyes that we have, we call them this, we call, we call it a formal decorative. You can see the colors, the varieties, even the, their self the same. Um, and you'll, you'll kind of get the, the feel of why we call them that. Formal is because everything lays over formally neat, uniform to do that, as opposed to uniform for a little bit squirrely, wavy, and all this to do there. These here are big, this, the, the, the orange one, that's a 14 inch bloom there. So it's pretty big. And that was our first big major show that we had here. Uh, then we have the semi cactuses, the cactuses. So there's something for everybody's taste to see, it's stuff you like to do. You see the colors of wild, in curved cactuses. Um, this, 
this particular style right here at Incurve is, is what the hybridizer is starting to move to because they think it's really cool to do it. And some of us think it's kind of confusing, but you all try to get everything to look good, and, but that would be a judging thing. So we have the Lucini, which is split little tips when they're supposed to be split. It's just, a lot of people probably like these and are familiar with I think Bob kind of liked this. We came up with the first one where the ball dahlias. And then you got some miniature balls. And it's all about the sizes. So ball dahlias would be uh, over four inches, and the miniatures would be under four inches. To do that. So that's how we distinguish for them. And then the palm, which is actually is a micro ball, but it's always been there. It's the palm. It's the one variety that we've always had a tiny one of. Stellars. And you got the water lily types to say to do that. <clears throat> Novelty fully double. And this is the crazy thing. So it's great for gardens, it's great for design, it's great for displays, it's crazy to judge. <laughs> so it's, there is no uniformity to it, and that's why they call it novelty, because it was something nice to look at, but we don't know where to put it. Let's put it in novelty and drive the judges crazy. <laughs> so, then we have the peonies. Um, we, we, hair, the, one, the, the peach color one, I've actually seen at the fair here to do that, and, and that's why we try to change things at the fair and educate the people to do this. They put it in as a single and it's actually an enemy, so it's like not understanding what it is. So we can get you that information, help them make some, we can make the dahlia section in the fair so much better and we start beating up on those glads that Clay likes to put in it does so well. <laughs> okay. uh, we have a novelty open. And when we call novelty, it's basically, it's a mixed type form or a form that doesn't quite conform to any set standard. Like normally this thing here would have been an orchid, but we have here the split tips, which in an orchid wouldn't be desirable to do it for an orchid. So we, you don't want to sit something that's interesting and just say stop growing it. We want to encourage diversity in this thing. And then it also has these, this collar inside here, these little petaloids running around. And so that's why it's a novelty, but it's an open because it's an open center. You can see the pollen. So a closed center, fully double, a fully double bloom is a bloom where you can't see the center. On purpose, that's where it's supposed to be until not when it, when it gets past the where it's spent, but when it's in, in its in its prime and open is when you can see the pollen and stuff. And when people ask, do dahlia smell? Well, they usually smell like plants. What they smell like they do. Um, if you can get the holy grail of dahlia, it would be a scented dahlia. Uh, but these open centers will have a scent because the scent usually comes. Some of our flower people know in here to do that is the pollen. That's what gets it sent so the bees come when it's time, they, they can smell it when it's time to come. Uh, we have an anemone type. Here's the collarette to do that. And the nice thing about the, or the one the nice thing about the orchid is that I had about a half a dozen of those when there wasn't a class for it. I'm totally against doing novelties. Threw them all away, and the next year they had an orchid class. So. <laughs> so you have to really think. We'll take a look and see. So now I just, it's tough not to throw anything away. So the orchid is just, it's a star looking, looking definition. So we call it, so we, orchids, when we give them the names, it's, it's like the shape. So what a shape would be. So you see a lot of orchids kind of look like that. And you like them where they roll and really nice. So these are two really nice ones to do that. And then the orchette, which is not really a novelty because I have a split, and these are some of the ones where it has this, this one here, Fancy Pants, and that was hybridized by Kathy Eiler. Um, they're from Goose Bay, and they were one of the founding members of our club. We have the singles. You'll see that. Then we have here the Mignon singles, which is just a smaller version, under two inches. So color wise, and we'll kind of whip through this just so you can see the colors and we can get into the meat of everything else. So the colors, you can see the colors we have. We have a whole, you should have some information. If not, we can, if you have emails, we can get information to you to do that. Or better yet, join a club, we go all over all this and hand it out and get it done. So you can kind of see the flames. You kind of see there's all kinds of choices out there for you to see what you would like to get. Dark blends, is, I know it's, looks white but that's the color tips what makes it the dark blend so we had it so don't get confused too much detail on that and do that and as you can see a light mention of why so you can kind of make it out but
but they're there. The ones everybody likes are these variegated ones. This is a Harvey Coop. That's a 10 inch, 10 to 11 inch bloom at times. Oh, that was you. Then we had the bicolors. So that's pretty much the, uh, on the different types and varieties that you can see. Uh, I don't know if you have any questions you want to ask right now on that part, or we can just move on to the soil conditions. No, let's see. Nope, okay, good. So the soil conditions, the, the best way we do before you do anything else is, is instead of just throwing stuff on top of your garden and not, not quite sure what to go on, is to do a soil test. Um, this soil test, you could, I get out of California, and uh, it's $50, and they give you a complete analysis. And not only do they tell you with the little, you, or you can just get a little soil test kit here at the like Dave's Hardware Store, um, but it won't give you the details. This here gives me my magnesium, my potassiums, my sulfur, which I never knew was low, but now it's up there where it's supposed to be. And it gives you all your trace minerals. And trace minerals are very important to dahlias. So when you're looking for a fertilizer for dahlias or a potting soil for dahlias, if it has trace minerals in it or mycorrhizomes in it, that's what we're looking for. Mycorrhizomes are the little guys that help. They're like the feeders and their, their waste that they put out is what the dahlias feed on. It helps the feeder roots get going. It helps them to break down whatever's around the soil to do that. So this is important so you don't go spending a whole lot of money on different fertilizers. As you can see, we have some fertilizers here and they're just the basic fertilizer. That 10, 10, 10 would probably work for most of the time that you guys can do that. And when you do fertilize them, you, you usually fertilize them at planting time and you probably fertilize them in August. And they pretty much that, unless you're going in containers or pots that we have here to do that. So, they, they want to have sort of has a lot of humus in it. And what's humus is it's the organics that are inside there to do that. Um, it's, it's what happens when they decompose, get a lot of microorganisms there to do it. These are things you can do. One thing you need to be careful though is that when you're using, you see like the shredded hay and the, um, you, even the yard trimmings and the sawdust, if it's too green, it will steal nitrogen from your plants. So we, if you have that stuff on there to do that fresh wood, fresh grass clippings even, they'll do that. Um, there is a process that, that's been tried the last few years, is lasagna grown down, is lasagna beds, and basically what they do is they take composted material, green material, brown material, green material, do that, and they never till. So they, they put them in raised beds, they pull, pop them out, wipe them off, put it down, put another layer of green on top, wait for next season to do. So this, this is a big important one that we have here is since we have, on the coast we have a lot of these evergreens and ferns stuff, our soils get very acidic. Um, you wonder what's kind of going on so you need to be careful that your plant doesn't look good. One of the first tests you probably should do if you know you're watering and not watering too much is to check the pH. So we, if they like it between 6.5 to 7.0 and which is neutral. And I keep mine about six, eight, and I think it, it seems to work the best. And you'll start noticing when they start getting acidic, they start getting weaker. You, st you start to see them kind of lean over a bit, and you see the color changes on them. But when you do raise your pH, I, I wouldn't think we need the lower pH here. You know, you want to do it slowly to do that. Um, and you can use ammonite that works really well. Um, hydrogelized lime gets it real quick do that so, so that will help you fast. So this is a list of stuff that you can put in there. Um, the one thing I, I do watch out for is the, the, the steer manure, steer manure, bag steer manure if you get it at the stores and stuff. It usually comes from like stockyards which is the same problem that with horse manure if it hasn't been aged too long but horse manure can break down. There's a lot of salt from the urine that's inside there. So that will cause you problems not only with your dahlias, but it'll cause you problems with everybody else around there. And if you ever noticed, and it, it has been reported a while back that they were putting pesticides in the, in the steer manure. And we were getting, all of a sudden our plants were getting deformed and wondering why, and that's what it came down to. But it's also, you gotta watch the salts. Uh, so all these things, you can look at them here. Wood ashes is really great to do, and you can see what it does, it's all fact done. 
sewage sludge? I don't know about that. <laughs> but they use them in places. They do. It's, the time is coming, so it's like, a, you know. Yeah, I'm, no, I'm not kidding, but it's true. It is there because it's there. So it's probably hotter than poultry, so you have to watch the poultry manures, and that's one thing you want to be real careful with chicken, chicken manure and stuff. It's very hot, and you can feel the bags. They're hot, so try to age them before you do that. Uh, and the best thing you can do, if you can find somebody who raises rabbits, rabbits are the way to go. You can actually plant straight-in rabbit manure. Like that, and then, and then it's cool right up. I guess it's all the alfalfa and carrots and lettuce they feed them, so they do a really good job. So the soil, you can see we, we, the, the root zones you're thinking are about 6 to 12 inches that we're looking like on these values where you're planting them. Uh, you you want to really work the soil. And if you're, you're mixing all these, these, these nutrients and additives, amendments, and, and even feed, it, it's always better to do it when you till it in so you can get it a chance to break into the soil to do it. If you drop it straight in the hole when you plant it, then it has no desire to stretch out and reach and help support itself in the wind and everything because it's all, all the goody stuff is right there for it. So hand tilling is the best. What we try to do is be careful when you roll the tiller. It's, it's hard panning, we call it. Uh, the tiller only goes down so far, and if you go the same thing, do the same way year after year after year, next thing you know, Oh, a couple of years ago, my garden was great. Now I'm getting my tubers rotting because they're too wet. Well, now the water can't drain. So to do that, so, the, so it's good to break it up once in a while to do that. Um, like mantises and stuff like that, they can they can do it, and they tend not to hard pan as as the bigger bigger units do. So it really depends on the condition of your soil to do that. So well aerated, well drained soil, and you can see here. This is uh, Clay still uses this wheel thing all the time. You know. <laughs> Young guy that he is to do that. But uh, you can see how you till the soil. You see how nice and light and fluffy. So you want to make sure you do it when the soil is not too wet, not too dry when you till. Mix your amendments in at the same time. It aerates the soil. Uh, so you broadcast it all the things so it help, helps out all that portion to do that. If you plant a number of values in the same locations, I separate them about 18 inches apart try to get as many as I can to do it. Uh, in this area here, 18 inches apart, but they also help hold each other up. Now, I stake them just in case, but sometimes I'll get a big wind. I'm up river and it's the, and everything kind of went. And it usually comes probably about two weeks before show time. <laughs> so, uh, I'm not there, wondering why I'm out there screaming and talking to myself, that's why. So I'm gonna do that. So, uh, person myself, I, I'm doing this thing, I'm using a pole sole digger to put them in there we we'll plant them so that it makes it easier for it to grow. Do that. The stakes also the stakes is easy for identification. So when I have garden tours and stuff, I have tags up on top and people can see what they are and what they are. And in the winter time, when I lose my map that I have, I can find them. <laughs> so and I, I map everything to do that. So here you see on the dahlias we're looking for is this little spot right here. Right here, these are your dahlia eyes here. And you can see here is where it's starting to come, and that's still okay to do that. You would plant these guys. When you do them, you get them inside the hole, you, you plant them laying down like so. Like this here. You can, and I have done it. And when you start them, like these are started earlier inside the thing, and I'll bring them up and I'll plant them like this. So all my stuff's coming here, and, and I still want to have about four inches of soil over the top of that because your new roots next year are going to come out. They don't come out from down here. They're going to come out from the new stem where it comes out to do that. And as you start these in the soil, when we do our starts, like our seedling starts, you'll see them. They'll be like this and then this is in the ground. This pair of leaves, set of leaves nodes will not come up and this is where your roots will be coming out. They will form. So we'll get in here and show you that's where we do cuttings. So that's where we try to we set that in there. So you plant them, you would plant them in. If you get a plant, so plant them just like tomatoes. You always plant tomatoes higher up. You don't plant them to the soil level. You plant them and get about a good four inches above, and they, they'll like it become more vigorous on there. So here's our buddies all the time. We've got the friends or foes on the thing. Anybody know which one's the good one? 
Ladybug. Okay, I gotta think of this way here. Okay, the last <laughs> ladybug. Yeah, red one. The other guy is probably our number one nemesis. It, the cucumber beetle or Diratica or other names we won't say in mixed company. <laughs> um, and to be honest with you, the best I, I try to do as much organic pest control as I can. Um, as not because I think, you know, better than anything else, it's because it also destroys your soil and the nutrients in your soil and the, the, the organisms that you want to survive in the soil, it, it kills them. So you have to be recovered. So the best method is go out early in the morning when they're sitting there still asleep inside your leaves and you see the little trail of droppings they left behind, you know, you got one and you go in and you find it and you squeeze it and that's about it. That's, <laughs> that's the best control for, for, for Dirotica to do that. This guy here. So everybody, hey, which one's the bad one? De depends on your opinion. Yeah. Right, yeah. So uh, I know the mole can be a real pain. It's, I, I have battles. I've tried to control them a few years. And last two years, I quit controlling them to a point. And to see when they start pushing up my tubers, they don't eat them, but they will push them up because they're finding these guys on the side. They also kind of decimated my nightcrawler population I had inside there to do that. But these cutworms are really nasty. Last year, I let them go, didn't treat them. Last year and a half, didn't treat them. This year when I dug up my tubers, I did not find one cutworm in my whole garden. So they will do the job. You just have to put up with mountains and places to do that. And here's another good friend, our little lacewing. So if you ever see these little eggs on the bottom of one of your plants, you, you, you find there's a lace wing out there and you don't want to kill this guy. He does a really good job. Takes care of your little other problems, aphids and whatnot. What, what's he called? Lace wing. And you can actually get them for doing it, but I don't know if we want to introduce any other lace wings in here, but you know, ladybugs and stuff work to take care of that. And one nice thing is if you try to find ladybug, try to find them that are sourced from the region and not from a, like back east or so. That, it will still help the other ladybugs, and they, the ladybugs that are here may not necessarily be able to handle a mite that might be on the ladybug that comes from the East Coast. So you have to be try to source your ladybugs locally. And then buy plenty so you can share with your neighbors and let them go and spread out and crawl over your neighbors and kill them all over there too, and they, they'll get rid of your fungus gnats and your aphids. And then these guys, everybody's favorite. Let's do that. Uh, and, and to be honest, it's really what I know people ask if they are, and I say they are deer resistant dahlias. Uh, but then I've had people say they've eaten them. It just depends on where you go. Uh, back up here at, at the, the church, we have them in a the church. They, the deer bed down there, and the only problem I have with them is when I walk behind, I make sure there's not, nobody sitting there so I don't scare them. They run through and break everything. Mm -hmm. And the same thing in my yard. I left my, leave my gate open all the time, and they walk through there and they just eat the weed seeds in between. Just take care of. So, but then again, if that's where to go and that's the only thing they have to eat, guess what? They're going to have a nibble, and you see, and you just keep an eye on it. If you start seeing a nibble, then you try to control it a little bit. Unless you get their big cousins, the, the elk, yeah. <laughs> they'll eat anything and everything. And I walked out in my garden one. I walked out in my garden one time, and so I was looking. I saw these footprints, and I was like, ah, the ground's not that soft. It can't be that big of a deer. If it is one, see, I've never seen elk back there. And, and I walked around and seen some droppings, and then I walked over to my first year seedlings, and they were 24 inches on Wednesday, and on Thursday they were six inches. So, <laughs> so fortunately, I fixed it, covered up everything. And the next night, put my game camera up, and they all, the whole herd was, was waiting in the corner. How we got in here last night? They were going to wipe out everything. So, <laughs> a question? Yeah, I have a, the black beetle with the red wings on it. Uh huh. Um, what is that and is that harmful? I, as far as I, I couldn't tell you because I'm not an, an expert on all bugs, but I've never had anything like that that really bothered any of the dahlias to do okay. that. So mm -hmm. yeah, I kind of looked at all the stuff that are dahlia problems, and I'm not too worried. So that might cause a problem with the trees or something else to do that, but I'm not sure. Once again, there's a lot of bugs too. And at the, the college used to have a program that you might have something, or even the Master Gardener program might be something good. They have a lot of people that are experts on that. Right, Carol? 
Carol, she's hiding. So, so the biggest, one of the big problems that we do have is viruses, the dahlias, and that's when we get into the, the propagation and stuff, we're really good, safe practices to do. The one you can really guarantee 100% you have a virus, is this guy right here, it's the mosaic virus, it's kind of like a, a tin tomato type virus to do that. If you see something like that, you, you dig out the soil, probably about a foot around it, get underneath it, bag it in a plastic bag right there and then, put it in a bag, make sure you wear disposable gloves, throw the gloves in a bag, and then take it to the dumps to do that, and then sterilize your tools. Mm -hmm. I even go so far as to take a blowtorch and torch the hole. Wow. Because it's very, very bad. Mm -hmm. And it'll get into all kinds of other stuff to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, this is another one that's a problem. It's gall, basically. It's like an embedded pimple. I, really, I never come out and it just kind of it wants to grow and it can't get anything, then break through. So anytime you run anything that the virus is suspect, you always want to be, you don't want to touch another plant to do that. And that's why pest control is so important because aphids and whatnot can pass that on grasshoppers. Mm -hmm. They can take it from one plant to the next plant to the next plant to do that. Uh, we have different types. Uh, one that could be right here, this one here could be nutrient-based type deal. Sometimes this, but this is most likely viruses. That's why when you see something like this, like this, you check your pH level of your soils. And one, one fallacy that people do when they say, I have a virus that looks weak, and they take a spray and they spray the leaves, and all of a sudden the plant looks wonderful. Well, what that is, the virus is the inability of the roots to absorb the nutrients to bring it up to the thing. So you're bypassing it. So you think, oh, you think, but you still have it. So don't, if you have any plants that look like that, come out, make sure you don't share them with people and take it around and, and do that because we don't share that kind of goodies. Powdery mildew is a big thing that we have around here. Uh, the safer, the safer is, 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 is kind of an organic type based one to use. Uh, another way you, to, to try to control powdery mildew is you, you keep about 12, 12 inches or so the ground to your first set of leaves so they get good airflow. Airflow will help and it's in any plant that you have. The airflow you have, if you have a garden that's bunched up doing that and you overhead water. I know we, we still get overhead water <laughs> all the time but uh, during summer what you don't want to do is have warm days, damp leaves, cold night, powdery mildew and that's why you start seeing it come in October is when it really gets bad if it does. But if you, if you strip the leaves down, and once you get your blooms, plants tall enough to grow and strip those bottom sets of leaves, the powdery mildew is, is, is a soil-based problem to do that. And I treat, I treat my, my plants, I, I treat for powdery mildew, and I treat for smut, which is kind of like rust, rose rust. You see how the family roses to do that. Um, I treat the soil before I till. I till, I treat the soil. And then when I plant, I treat the soil again, top of the soil. So when you overhead water, the stuff splashes, hits the bottom leaves, and it, that's why you see at the bottom it starts walking its way up your plant. Do that. So propagation. So the seeds, you guys got some seeds to do that. Those, those seeds came from just about three varieties that, you, that I have to do that. Um, Dahlia is very unique. That's why the hybridizers love new. That's why we have 50,000 different named varieties, because they have eight sets of chromosomes. So the, the original one I started with, the one in the middle here, Dagmar, um, was the seed parent to Thanks Mom. And then it was also the seed parent to McKee. And then Thanks Mom, seed parent Jennifer Stream, and John Grant came from Dagmar. So these all came from the same plant, and it looks nothing. They tend to take, and they, they, these are here are the incurved cactus and cactus styles. So when you get a seed to do it, it will tend to take the characteristics of the parent plant, which is the female plant. It, it will take that characteristic on, but the colors, you have no idea what you're going to get. So the only way you're going to get, if you want to, you have a, a bloom that you, you like, um, it's like we're working on a cafe alouette. For one of our people here to do that, that she can't take the seeds, you have to take tubers or cuttings to do that, and you get your true clones. Otherwise, you don't have a true clone, which makes it exciting. 
So you see, it'd be interesting to see the stuff that you guys get there to do that. So there's a lot more, as Bob was saying, there's a lot of big words in this thing. The thing of it is, just remember, most plants and people have two sets of chromosomes. These have eight, so you can imagine that they're having a party. So. <laughs> Uh, one thing I would do, you'll say, we'll talk about this, this thing is that people buy it and it's a big scam on eBay and all that stuff and Amazon, blue dyes. And they tint the picture blue. There is no blue dye. There never will be a blue dahlia. Unless we get a geneticist splicing the gene into there to make it blue, then it'll be something different than the dahlia. Because that trait, that hereditary trait, is, gene is not in the dahlia blue. So it's, it's missing. So don't buy a blue dahlia from China, <laughs> and to be surprised it comes out, it's lavender, so. Yeah, yeah. So the tubers, so you can see we have all our little buddies here to do that, and we'll, when we take a break, we'll go into that, and we can sit there and look at it, and see, and, and, and show you how we divide them and what to work with stuff. So any other questions you have right now so far? Nope, oh, good. And you didn't wave when I didn't repeat the question last time. <laughs> So here's our little buddies here that we're looking for. These here, you see these little eyes. When you first dig them up, they're always more prominent. They stick up. This one, it's already grown a little bit to do that. So they are tubers, they're not bulbs. So it's kind of like the rhizome type deal almost. Here's how we get things cut in off. Uh, uh, the, the little corner, I'll show you a better picture to the left, but this is how we start stuff. I, I would like to say those two plants were a start, but they were like, I left them in there and I forgot. And I, <laughs> I went in two months later and I saw this growing, and I'm like, ooh, thank you. So, <laughs> so I put it in the hothouse instead of leaving it outside. So cuttings, this is a big thing. We can get into more stuff, but this is just ways so you can understand the propagating, what we do. Uh, this is so we can get, so if you get one variety, um, like I mentioned, the Cafe Alouette, it's a, it's, a, it's a terrible dahlia for exhibition, but it's a beautiful dahlia for designs, and it's a wedding, and it's a big thing, and it's got to be something because people are trying to sell it for $25 a tuber right now, so. Wow. But so all the florists are really looking for it. So I'm actually propagating some to do that for one of our members. It kind of had one that had a little accident with the plant, so we're trying to do it, and it's, I'm actually cheating on the thing to doing that. I'm actually going up here and I'm taking, I'm letting it grow taller so I can, if this was taller, I would cut this off here and then I would split those leaves, which would be in the next one. And then these leaves down here, I would split this in half and I get roots growing from here and I get roots growing from here to do that. <coughs> so on that one particular cutting, when we get this, I can get three plants out of it. So if you have something that's really special, something that's, that you, you like a lot to do it, that's one way you can propagate it and save it. To do that. And that's what happened with this one. It kind of got broken up when it was dug up to do that. So we found a couple that were still good, okay, and uh, we're, it's starting to grow right now, so we make a cutting. Yeah, Tim. But you're putting the slips directly in the soil, are you going, are they going water first? Okay, Tim and I know, do we put the slips in soil or we put them right in the water? I put them right into the soil. I, I have, as you can see this here, these trays. Oops, whoops, whoa, wow. Oh. <laughs> Wrong button. <laughs> there, I have to hit the dot. And it wasn't wearing my glasses. So this is just a, a little 72 slot tray. I put a, a, a potty mix in here to do it and then I put them in. I also use Oasis wedges as a foam wedge. Because when I, when I sell the stuff and ship them out, you can't ship soil. So it goes in the Oasis. And the Oasis, it's, it's a foam that has the same cellular structure as the, the plant. So soft stem plants can be put in to do that. Do you use uh, root starter on these with you? Do I use root starter? Yes, you can see the picture in the center. Um, and I use Clonex to do that. Uh, one thing I've, it's C-L-O-N-E-X. Um, the little jar, about four ounces, cost you about $28. However, it has a lot of benefits besides growing to do that. It has protection. It's kind of like antibiotics for the plant. You put it in without being an antibiotic to, to do that thing. Natural stuff would get in there. 
I also, it sticks better to the, when you put it in the ground, and I find when you use root tones, the powders, you have to be really careful. You have to do that, knock off the excess, do, otherwise you burn them. You, you, the, the, so the powders will tend to burn. So it's like anything else, whatever quality you want to get, it's going to get the quality at the end. I know, I know some people, and I was at a, a, a grower the other day, and he just puts them straight into the Oasis wedges, doesn't bother, says, doesn't matter. So, and, and that's his experience. Everybody's experience could be different. It could be, there could be other things that determine. I have found, and I've tried different ones, and God, for the last six, seven years, I've used nothing but Clonex gel to do that. So the seeds, it's another way we're propagating. I forgot what the next slide was. There you go. So, so you see the seeds you have. Not all the seeds will go. Um, the seeds, I'll have some like outside I didn't bring in right before. I was running around crazy trying to make sure I didn't forget anything. And uh, you can see some of we got started. But you just take them. I take like a plastic. I, well, I use a large tray for some, some of mine because I'll get up to 10,000 seedlings to start and go there. Uh, but you put them in the trays. Put some paper towels down, sprinkle your seeds across the top of them, so don't pile them up because they'll get rotten. And more paper towels on top, keep them moist, and you can keep them on top of the refrigerator, keep them someplace where they're warm. Don't put them right in the windowsill because they'll cook and dry out too fast. And after a couple of days, you'll start, they'll start sending out a little shoot coming out from them, and you have a new variety. So when that thing blooms, you'll be the first person to ever see that in the world. And I kind of, that's why I kind of like seedlings more because. I eat more all the other stuff and I go out the seedling patch first and I go, ooh, it's like Christmas every day. <laughs> Especially when you get that. Yeah. So, you know, like that thanks mom white one, you see that's that's one that's been in the cream of the crop now for a few years, which just means that it has to win so many awards to get nationally recognized for the thing. Eventually I'm sh shooting for the fabulous fifty, which is means it's won fifty or more blue and higher awards throughout the country to do that, but it's just getting distributed throughout the country to do that. Um, so, yes? Tell them how many plants are ac actually active uh, enough to uh, show uh, that comes out of uh, percentage-wise out of all your, all your seeds. So, so it was, Kai was mentioning about what's the percentage of the seeds that turn into, the question would actually turn into something. The, the one year I did 10,000 seeds, seven years ago, I now have 11. I'm going to do that. So it's mainly because I'm told I'm picky. <laughs> and my wife calls it the field of death out there. <laughs> because I'll go, well, you don't make the grape, pluck it out, throw it down, now it's weed mulch. You know, that's not something I recommend because they can get problems to do it, so I watch that. But I'll leave them down there to keep the weeds down and control the weeds stuff and, and let the bugs eat those things they want to eat them and, and donate them. Because I'm looking for a specific trait or a specific quality and I want this thing. And it's like, I, I, there's a debate that was going on between flowers for cut flowers and exhibition flowers. And people saying exhibition flowers don't last as long as cut flowers. Well. I will sometimes cut my blooms on a Tuesday for a weekend show and still have it be able to be judgeable on a Sunday when I'm throwing it, picking it up and abusing it on the way back. And we, you know, we have people that wait out for the flowers when we do that thing. So to me, I think that's a pretty good cut flower that will last that long, that doesn't happen. Um, the other reason why they go through so many dahlias on, on the seedling space, most of your, your seeds will be open centers. So it will be the, the, like the singles and the orchids, or they won't have enough rows of florets on them, so they won't be up to snuff. And the majority are white and yellow. So I'm trying to look for another color. So white and yellow are the two biggest genes on those to get that. Uh, if you, if yellow is really good, especially if you have a male judging team, so you see them do that, because the men see yellow better. Huh. And that's why the women like the pastel colors and the men's, and that's why you have a discussion when you're judging the table, which one's better when they're both really fine and the only different is you're looking at the color, but you're not supposed to look at it. You're supposed to judge color by color quality, not color red, pink, yellow, white. So mm -hmm. that's a fun thing. That's another discussion that we have. We'll see. 
Um, so that's the reason why to do that. And I also get some that come up that are, look like somebody else's and I want something different. So it's a, so you, it, I probably was a little too picky. I had more and I was told I shouldn't throw so many away, but you have, I'd have four million if I didn't. Um, when you grow something from seed like that, does it always, when you get the, do you have to like clone with them to get it through? Or does the next seed, what do you get yeah, the next year? So he wants to know if when you do a seed, start plant from seed, will that seed turn into the same thing or do we have to clone it to keep the thing? And once again, you have to clone. Every time a seed, a new seed from a seed, it's always a new variety. It's a genetically, it, you can test it genetically and it will be different. It may look the same, but it will be genetically different, so that's why it's not a true clone. So you have to propagate it that way with the thing. The other nice thing about seedlings, the one question we get asked all that, if I put a seed in, will I get, you will get flowers that year, and you will get tubers that year. So that's how we get it. And then we get tubers, use the small tubers, then we propagate them in this way, and then, so we can have enough varieties, enough plants, so we can get something going and do that to pass all the evaluations. Any questions? Any more questions on that thing? Is that actually there? Good? Yep. Got that thing. So it's really cool. So seeds are the way to go. So uh, what we do as far as our, our club activities we got here, we do, we try to expand the culture to do that. This is way, and as you can see, these are, every single one of these are values, and you're wondering, people, wow, I didn't know that's what they were. Uh, we do try to do an, a, do a, uh, an exhibit at the, at the fair. We'll do that. Uh, another thing that we'll do, we'll do is that we have the class who will bring some stuff that you can actually see, touch, smell, feel, do this, and try to do some hands-on things, and we, the bigger the crowd we get, the more stuff that we can do, and also looking to being in guest speakers, because so, I get tired of listening to myself sometimes. Because I don't want to bore it. It's a, I, I can go on for this forever to do that. It, it is very passionate, like I said, and it reminds me when I was a kid, and it's blood sport when you get older and you can't play football or stuff like that, so now you compete with flowers. <laughs> <laughs> so, and, and, and as you can see, I'm doing a basket. So we try to teach you how to do, do your baskets and all the exhibits. And uh, we have some great experts in, in, in our society. I'm not one of them when it comes to baskets, but I will give it a go and do my best. So. Of course, this is the, the back of the Bethany Lutheran Church is right up next to behind the Conoco station there, over by the hospital. So we have to do that. And if people don't have gardens, we kind of give you a, a space to do a few, take a few up if you want to do it, be part of the experience to get it done. And then next thing you know, you'll be like one of our members over here digging up his front lawn and replacing it with dye beds. <laughs> Way to go. <laughs> so, so then we have get together, we do a little dig and vibe and do this. So we show you how to do everything right in the beginning to do that. And we have a nice little, when it comes up, this is one of the garden tours we have. Made it challenging, we don't have the garden club anymore because they want to have a garden tour in the middle of July and Dallas are usually best for mid-August. So yeah, it was so this, this garden was planted really early and fortunately we had warm things. And that's when you look at it and we feel, well, when do we plant these guys to do that? Um, you can actually start planting them here probably next month, at the end of this month, to do that. You don't want to where the soil's too wet. Um, and when you do plant them, there's, there's enough moisture in the soil where you don't water them or do anything to them until you see about two or three inches of, of green above the ground mm -hmm. to do that. So that definitely is a big help. Uh, Could you repeat that? I didn't hear all that you said. Oh, for planting dahlias, I said, is, it, repeating this, the, the same quote what I was just saying, um, is that the end of April to mid -April, if we start getting more sunny days and it doesn't look like it's going to rain, feel free to put it in because we're not really worried about frost here unless you're up river a bit. And I don't think we're worried about frost here at that time. It's mostly about being the soil being too wet because they will rot if you don't have them in there to do that. So you plant them, don't water them again until you see two or three inches of green coming above the ground do that. Um, and if you do stake them, stake them before you put them in the ground because you'll run right through the hole and I thought I could do it. Now yeah, I'd run right through the middle of the tuber. <laughs> <laughs> and they can make it. They can, they can actually make it. Uh, up here at the church I had one time, I had a dahlia growing off to the side and I said, oh, 
it must have been a seed that fell down. And I got a new seedling and grown, oh, it's looking really nice. And it's like, it looks very familiar. So as well, could be, could have happened. I dug it up and it was just a little bit of the, the, the crown and the tuber. I cut it with the tiller and it grew. So they can do it to do that. See, so definitely do that. Um, but uh, I would wait. And the biggest thing is, is some people try to cheat and plant them in February or March. Uh, do that. And then wait, 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 wait. And why nothing's happening? And I'll plant my stuff in the second week of June and we both have blooms at the same time. <laughs> so it's, it's because of the overnight temperatures. Mm -hmm. So when the, the soil starts warming up, if you blanket your soil, you can help that speed of the process along to do that. So the nighttime temperatures determine how fast they get going. So that's where you'll see something. I try being tricky and plant one next to each other different sizes. Because it's always like when you get ready for a show, if there's a bloom, oh, it's not ready, it'd be great for next week, or it was great last week. Try to cheat, no, they're all ready at the same time. So, yeah. what, do you, what do you blanket it with? Uh, it would blanket it with a breathable cloth, so you can use like a black cloth, so it absorbs the sun, hits down, it'll let water transpire through it, and it won't cause you any rotting it, and if it rains, it'll go down through it, but you don't want to cut it up, you use black plastic, you'll, you'll, that's what you'll kill it. You can get away with it for a little while, but you just forget, and then it can push up the cloth. It's really easy to do that. And then you can always leave that cloth down as a weed cloth, and when you see where it comes up, cut the little hole out, open it up, and let the plant grow through it. So we come get a nice garden. So this all works into the end. We tried to do this. We get down for it to have the show. This is a picture of our first show here at, at the event center. Uh, which will be at the event center again if we don't burn the last seven acres that we have left in the county. <laughs> <laughs> so it would be great to do that. When's the show going to be? Uh, it's at um, August 31st, September 1st. And this is just a lot of things that you'll see at the shows. This here, the one on, the, on your right is uh, your left. It's our show here, one from our show. The other one is from neighboring show. Do you take uh, entries only from club members? Well, we d usually when you when you for do it at a sanctioned show, you accept that you have to be a member of the society. Last year it started here, and I'm trying to get the move to do that, is that we had a open to, to any gardeners to do that. Uh, we, we limited to three blooms to do that. Um, Irma here brought in a couple blooms. She had black satin, and that won the best bloom in for that division and made it to the head table. So and it was actually, quite honestly, I've told that story, and I think it was pretty fantastic because the find of black satin without spots on it was amazing. It's a really rich, velvety, burgundy color, and it was just perfect. If, actually, if we had done, had some experience, she had the set of leaves on it like it would have done, it, it would have had a good chance to be in up one of the best ones in the show for that division, for that class. Not just the division, because we have divisions for novice, amateurs, and advanced to do that. But we do have that. You can contact me. That information be here to get that done, and we'd love to have it. So you can get part of the experience. You can see what's going on to do that. Also, be prepared to have it at the fair, and, and I'm going to try this year to have some cans available. So we're not putting them in those Coke bottles and are leaning over. So we <laughs> make them look good, make them proud like the way they're supposed to be. Because they're, they're, you know, we are a, 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 an, aid, a, an organization that has standards just like the orchids or the cactuses or all that. So we kind of do that and then bring up and, and help you out. But yes, it would be great to have them down there. A good experience for you, was it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you can see it gets a little crazy at these shows to do that. So there's the thing. That was the national show up in Everett, Washington. Yeah, it was pretty amazing. It's, um, we had gotten to the point where we had 12, I think it was 12 Hamari Accords, 12 or 10 Hamari Accords with the yellow semi-cactus, all standing next to each other. Eight judges couldn't figure out which was the best one. <laughs> so I happened to be just an, uh, not a senior judge at the time, but an accredited judge, an ex-level judge, 
And one of the guys that knew me from our conference, because Washington was out of, at that time was out of our conference, and asked me, to have, you know, take a look at it. I went over to bed and I looked and I looked and I went through all the things to do. And about five minutes later, I picked one, and they go, "Well, how can you pick why that one?" I said, "Because that's the only one of all these that doesn't have a thumbprint on it." <laughs> <laughs> so that's how it can be. It's really it's a great experience to do that. You don't have to worry about doing it because everybody's going against different classes. They have the amateurs going into the novices and doing that. And it's, I've gotten past the need to win stuff now, is the enjoyment of, and it's my seedlings to do that. And there's a few people that I have respect in, in, our, in our conference and stuff, what their opinion is, because as a hybridizer, I like to know what they think of the new stuff that's coming out to do that. And it's just a culture and a memory that you, you sit there and do it. So this, you know, the way you start your own stories, your own memories to do that, and it happens. But it's fantastic, and there was just tons and tons and tons of loot. And since we're on tape, I won't mention how I did, because I don't want to sound you. Know, we'll <laughs> we can edit that part. You can edit out the part where I said how many I won. So I did pretty good from there for being a, an Oregonian going all the way up to Washington where they have perfect condition, they have sun in the morning, their shade cloth pulls over in the form of clouds and they get a little bit of water and the temperature's right and they start over every day. So that's why their blooms tend to be oversized, bigger. So they have actually, we have a separate supplement for size charts for the Northwest to do that because they do get bigger from doing that. Another thing that you can do to show if you're not necessarily in growing is those people that we have photography. So there's a photography doing it so you can come, we can get in the show and do that and you do your photographs. Um, it's, it's all national. The one, the, the the collection of them is from a national show doing that. Uh, we also have you have the one where you're driving down a bumpy road and hit a hole and your head breaks off. We have floaters. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's where it comes from. And there's actually we have a few exhibitors. Um, Ember May over from uh, from D Douglas County. She really does this a lot to do that. And you can make them unique. And there are actually, it looks like, oh, no big deal, simple. But there are, when you get into it, into it there are a lot of rules, a lot of things you look at, and you try to make, you're making your distance equal from the edges. You make sure your base doesn't take over with the bloom, because we want to showcase the bloom to do that. So that's a great one to show in the first time to do it and get it. And that's all stuff that we would help you with and do it. Kind of how we have, we, we develop and mentor programs. I'm, been the mentor for everybody, and they get phone calls or a text message and say, "What's this?" And I, go, I don't know. I mean, we have to see the whole thing and go over to do that. But Carol and, and Bob are, kind of, are doing it in mentoring programs, and we all do that, and they're getting moving up. So, yeah, we kind of help everybody to make you feel good and, and useful, and we'll just help whatever it is. Uh, the old days, it used to be carry the secret to the grave. Uh, I had a friend that helped me. Much respect that helped me to get into the thing about doing the cuttings was Rick Edwards. He was an exhibitor from the UK, and uh, he told me if the people start telling a junk throw it away, they're worried about what the scene you're bringing in. Uh, but he, he's showed me how to do the cuttings and, and do that stuff. So it it really helps so you can like, have a mentor program and do that. Uh, another one that I have that, that meant a lot to do that is was Wayne Chance and Eleanor Chance. That there are uh, senior judges, long-time Dahlia people out of Eugene, and I had a lot of respect for what he did and listened to him, and, and actually if he critiques me sometime, I take it like personally and get upset and try not to go and cut this out, go out and cry someplace. <laughs> <laughs> but you have a lot of respect for the abilities. And, and actually another one I have there is the guy that does this stuff is my brother. Uh, he's a big-time influence. He started doing competitive Dahlia's the year before, two years before I did, and I got into it, and I just went crazy. But he does a lot of the, the design, artistic designs that we do inside the shows for here. Um, and that's one thing where the Dahlia culture has come a lot, mentioned in England at one time, ladies, don't get upset, I'm just speaking history, that women were not allowed to exhibit in Horton, so we'll let them do the design, the, the arrangements, we'll let them do the arrangements. <laughs> Well, to be honest with you, baskets and rangers make a big impact on the show because it shows you what can you do with them when you bring them home. Mm -hmm. What can you do with them? Take? So it's a big impact, it's a big importance. So that's why they said to take them to the graves. And, and Rick told me, he says that they had this one variety where this guy was just a champion after champion after champion and nobody can grow it. 
And before he died, he says, yeah, you know how we take the plants and you take the laterals and you break them off, the low ones go on the ground and you get the nice bloom on top too. You go, yeah, yeah, he says, I cut that one in the middle and I pull all those, sort of those junky ones from the side. And that's how the bloom grows. So, so you learn that with a mentor program, they teach you those things to do that. So as you can see the dahlias, you can see there's that one there, so the field that my garden, that's why I'm trying to get, stop doing yellows and stuff, because I have plenty of yellows and oranges. I'm going for more of purples, lavenders, and do that. So you can see we have that one in the middle of me on Sigmund. And you can see I have a deer walking around in the yard. There's another one at the end of the row down there. And she was just eating, uh, that, I think it's a nightshade, whatever, that little black looking, looks like a little miniature black tomato, stuff like that. And she's just eating those, I let her. Black, black night shaded us to do that. So she's eating it. Okay, you're fine. You're happy and you're helping me and I don't have to bend over and weed. <laughs> so we do that. And another thing that we see what we do here is that you see how I have the space in between the garden because these bushes will get bigger to do that. But also try to leave room so you're not walking right around your dahlia plant so you don't compact the soil because that will cause damage. It will cause all kinds of things, issues for you to do that. So our show, our annual Dahlia show is, this will be our sixth one, it's August 31st to September 1st at the Event Center at the Beach. Um, there's my contact information, you can get a hold of me to do that. I think Rebecca at the library will have some information to do that. Um, I'm also over at Bear Ridge Systems, and you'll see me at the grocery store in my van a lot of times. So you can, anytime you have a question, see me, ask me about it, I'll stop and talk. And the one nice thing about we do get involved with people, you find a lot, the majority of exhibitors when you get inside this and you do this thing, is that we have people that we haven't seen for 11 months, yet when we get together we talk like we just met yesterday, seen each other yesterday and carry on the conversation. So it's a good thing to do. But it's also, it's garden growing, it's just the same as you can see, we have them everywhere here to do that. So in the end, this is what we try to get for to go, and we have these Nice big awards, and you see. So, I mean, how many have been to the show here? Oh, fantastic! <laughs> you need to come. You didn't show up. <laughs> so it's great to do. It's it's free to get in there. There'll be uh, there'll be plants for sale then too. We'll have plants for sale. Um, we also have. You can see anybody that has badge, senior judge badge, and growers stuff that they will talk. Do you have any questions? Uh, you may not get a hold of me because I might be running around crazy because we're trying to get all the, the uh, data information in. And Carol hides in the back, so we ask her. But if I can, I will stop, always stop and make time to see and ask questions to anybody who's more than willing to help. And even if it's a question to your garden, to do that. And if like the first time I met Clay was at that first show, and here's this guy walking in with these five or six dahlias in his hand walking it in, and he asks, Mike Eiler is a friend that has passed since now. What he thought of the dollars, and he says, pointed to me, he says, go ask Bob. Bob ran out the other door because I didn't have the heart to tell him what I thought. Now I'm a little bit nicer. <laughs> so I try to encourage him to do that, so we see. So if you have any questions, we have any questions, go ahead. Do the hummingbirds like it? Do hummingbirds like it? Hummingbirds will go to the open center ones because they can get some pollen and do that. They will try to get inside there. Uh, one thing you do want to be careful is when you go out there in the morning or late in the evening time and you go moving and picking and looking at things, you might have a nice little bumblebee hiding in there because they sleep inside there. Mm -hmm. Do that. It makes it very interesting when you go out there and grab it and your hands start buzzing. <laughs> so, so you can do that. But hummingbirds will try to go. But there's not so much nectar in there as there is pollen. I think the color gets their attraction to do that. Let's see. Um, in this climate, do you dig the tubers out? Yeah. Digging out the tubers in this climate. No, you, not necessarily if you have well-drained soil. You can leave them in a little bit longer. Uh, we'll sh we have a clump over here that will show you. Uh, if Yerma can bring out, this is what happens when you leave them in there. Year after year after year to do that to see. This is what it looks like if you put one so, tuber in the ground. This is what you got after two years. So <laughs> after they, if the soil is well drained, and right after the break, we'll have one so we can see it on on camera, and we'll we'll show you that how to take care of that situation. Do that. 
if there's anything, if you're up in the, the, the higher park, 500 feet or so up in here to do that, you might get a, a little bit of mulching on them to do that. But the main thing is to keep it well drained and they'll, they'll just go. But one thing which you do want to avoid is the problem is that when you look at it and you see the plant, I have one plant. No, you don't. You, every single one of those tubers is a plant. So that one right there, there's 25 plants competing for the same water, mm -hmm. the same food, the same sun. So it makes them all weak. So they'll do that. So it's like, if you have experience with the irises, you notice how your irises, ah, oh, they're wonderful. And then three or four years down the road, what's wrong? And you go dig up and get around. Next thing, all they're back. It's the same thing. Everybody's fighting for the same stuff. That, oh, well, we'll take a, a little five minutes break to get a snack, read, walk the thing, and we'll go and we'll show you the parts about uh, dividing the tubers to do that. The one thing you guys know how to do that is the thing I have is here. Some people are, are interested in, I don't have a big yard to do that. Um, this base, this base here, I did this, and uh, I think it's a, a seven gallon one. Yes. Do that. Uh, when I first moved up here and it was a living in Rogue Hills, I grew all my competition blooms in the bases just like this and did quite well. We had, I think we had a gentleman that was from New Zealand came down from Portland just to see because he didn't believe I was growing them in the pots. <laughs> so they take more time, they take more care, they take more water. You have to watch them. They, you water probably every other day to do that because water will drain out. And they need to be fed once a month on the day that you pull them in pots. Um, you can also grow in this size pots and get these nut. This, this plant here is a little mignon singles. To do this. It's, a little, it's a little small bloom. A lot of growers grow them in these pots here or these pots because these little plants only get about this tall on the average. So they're only about 18 inches uh, tall. So that's why most people don't like growing them because you're bending over this budding and do the same thing you do with the big dahlias to do that, to get what you want to do that. But if you want something that's going to be bee happy and add a lot of color, you pinch the top one off, it starts budding out and spreading out. And you can put this on a garden and you don't have to worry about this little vase blowing off and taking your neighbor's truck out or something like that off your balcony. So you can grow them in containers to do that in the city. So we definitely. So if you have any questions, you, after we come back to this, so it'll take about five minutes here, and then we'll just do a real quick on the divide, on, on the tuber clumps to show you that, and that could be about ten minutes, and then you know we'll call it an evening. Right. You can go ahead and play right. Eli. Right. 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 Yeah. Oh, you can yeah. guarantee it. <laughs> you can guarantee it. Throw me under the bus. <laughs> Okay, so in, in the age of technology, our cameraman let his iPad die. So we were, hopefully we're going to put it up on a screen. You can see what we can do to do this here. So if you want to scoop, we'll try to make the best we can to do this. The other thing. Is, is just try to remember if you get more involved, get the, we will give you details and we'll have to do hands on stuff. And it, 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 we really try to do hands on training and, and, and at, the, at the, the meetings that we do. And as some people know, they go, Bob, I need out, and I go over there and, and I help. I'm hoping to get enough members, we teach enough people so everybody else can go and, and helps everybody else. Do. But I like it, so it's okay. So, um, a couple of things, one of, one of the questions that came up when we were up here during the break was asking about hybridization, how do I do it and stuff, and I kind of glossed over that because I didn't want to get in too much detail, but there's a little interest. That's why the bees are your buddies, that's why I avoid pesticides and do that, except for I'll use anything to kill slugs. <laughs> Everybody, I go to the shows and I go up to Portland and it's hot. I go to the valley and it's hot and this and that. And they go, oh, they just, that's why they grow those blooms over there on the coast. They have it made. I said, yeah, but we have slugs that you strap saddles on. So. <laughs> <laughs> and our gentle breeze is 40 miles an hour, so quit complaining. Yeah. <laughs> you can put a shade cloth up, I can't put a wall up, and then the barricade to keep slugs and wind out. So, you know, it's, it's a little challenging. So to do that. But as far as the hybridization stuff to do is one trick that I can, you can hand pollinate it. And like I said, there's no secret. So the people that will see this later, if they're from other societies, I'm telling you my trick to do this. It's, and a lot of people know that bees can only carry so much pollen. Look, there's only so much work that they can do. And they're also blind. They don't 
jump around and go to the thing. They go from point A to point back to the I and back and back and back and forth. So I'll, uh, that's why I have two elevations. So I have my smaller varieties down below and the bees pollinate that. And the higher elevations, I have my large blooms and they go up to that level and they pollinate that stuff and do that. But I also will take two blooms and I'll take the, the stems of the blooms and I'll take them and I'll cross them over like this next to each other. So the blooms are right in the thing. And then I'll cut the top of the, the florets and I'll cut a trail. And the bee just goes, walks back and forth like this. <laughs> and then I take the seed parent that I want and I thank the bees very much and do the work and I didn't have to go out there yeah. with pollen on a Q-tip. So, or take them and bounce them together. So if you want to do that, you see one one part of it, you can cut it, take the thing and put it. But you got to remember, it matures at different times, so you have to do it a couple times to do it. So I have enough things that I do so we don't do this. So that does help to do that, and that will get you a thing. Um, so when we come to tuber clumps, if you guys are in the dahlias, and you haven't dug up since the 1970s, <laughs> you'll probably have dahlias like this. And as far as digging up a VIS thing, um, I'll show you this one here. That Bloom right there, that, that, oh, wow. not up there today. <laughs> wow, it's, it's wonderful. <laughs> Give me one second, let me hit the button. Oh, hit the thing, thank you. Our tech guy whose iPad died is going to push the button. I hope it's not, I'll hit the air one. All right, thank you, government employee. <laughs> this one here was planted by my dad in the 60s next to the fence that the, the, on the other side of the fence for the neighbor's yard to make it look because they had nothing in the yard so we're trying to make it look nicer to do that. That plant was in the ground for 40 years. It was never taken care of properly and, uh, and it just went and went. When. So if the conditions are correct, Bay Area, prepare for winter down there, you just close the door. <laughs> you know, so that was pretty much it. Uh, so, so they can do, they can survive, it's got the genetics, and I'm trying to get that genetics and other things and using it to do that. Um, so you can't leave this in. This here is a two year clump to do that. So I'll show you this thing here to look at, you can see, you can have, we, have, we have stalks coming up here, right here, and here, and here, and here. And the first year we had one stalk come up, you can get two. If it does break, it will shoot another one up to do that. So if you ever happen to break one, if you cheat and say, how come I don't see green yet, and you got your fingers in there and you hear a snap, not that I've ever done that. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, oh my God, start all over again. So it, 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 they will do that, so they really, really try to survive. And that they were, as far as hardiness, and the other thing that was brought up, that they were discovered uh, in Central America, Southern Mexico, and the foothills to do that, taken over to Europe. And when they got to Europe, they put those seeds, and all of a sudden, what happened here? This is not what we had. But they, fortunately, they did take some tubers over there with them to do that, and then the hybridization went from from England area and, and moved up to, to, the, to the Netherlands and, and went up there and it came back, eventually came back to the United States and over on the East Coast where it all started and came across. Another question that was asked here and thing, are they edible? Uh, they are. Um, they, you make sure you grow them organically or don't put stuff on there, it's like anything else. If you're gonna put food, I wouldn't put hard chemicals on there. They have a very high sugar content. Um, I also found that the whites and the yellows are better than the, the dark colors. The dark color tubers tend to be fibrous, and more fibrous, and more woody. Mm -hmm. They have a high sugar content in them to do that. And if somebody makes them like sweet potato yams to do that, oh, he's gone. Uh, it's like, oh, they can be real sweet to do that. So you can also use them for alcohol. If you want to do that, so, <laughs> yeah, so you can make a match. But a lot of people take them, dry them out, grind them up. Make flour, make bread out of them, and do that. So they are edible. They have recipes to them, and they actually the name that came up for the dahlias in the South America is was a water tube because they're, they're they have their hollow tubes, 
and you're out in the thing and they need water, and they would cut the plant between, between the nodes and have a node between the top and bottom and hold it, and then you cut the top node off of the leaves, you open a hole and you drink and you have water out of the straw, so do that. Wow. Which is another reason they hold so much water, why you don't water during the heat of the day. Because if you get in the valley temperatures or up in Agnes, you can literally boil them from the inside. Wow. They will go black. So that's why they let it absorb the water in the, in the evening time. And I think that's kind of what we went through that when it was asked during the break to do that. That helped you out. It's fantastic to do. So if you like, take your time with Q-tips all you want. All you guys out there, <laughs> do that. Let the bees do the work. You know, it makes them happy and they get paid very well. They just take whatever they want back with them. So this is a two-year club to do that. So most of you people that, are, that have that will be involved in this, you, you, you're not trying to sell things to do this. You're not trying to get every single tuber off this to do what you're trying to do to make this plant manageable to do that. So I made sure I didn't wear my suit so I can do this. A lot of the tubers that are hung on the bottom are actually going to be useless. Uh, this one here and this one here were two of the part of the original mother tubers. It's spend its energy, it's no longer any value and stuff like that, so we can just, we just go ahead and we just get that out of the way to work. And they will kind of, when they get to this point, when they, we've let them sit for a while, they will kind of work together and just kind of wiggle them apart, where you grab the stems here and the stems here. It looks really nice on camera. <laughs> and it comes apart, so you can see, there we had a plant there. And then, uh, Put this here, and there's another one here. You can do that. Whoops. And make the spot where you can get in here. And then you break them off to do this. Now, this is not a recommended usual thing, but if you're just going by the garden to do this, it'll be fine. Uh, make sure you give the bad clumps to your friends. <laughs> so you can do that. So now we've got this under control where we can, we can work with this. And we broke it off, and this is what we need. And we, you, we make sure that we have our eyes on here, it's part of the crown goal, we can take this, and we can take this one here, and we get it, and we always get a sharp, this is a knife here, big handle, got this, and do that, and you pick up these hardware, got to do the thing, so you get down here, watch your fingers, just come down with a knife, get in between there, and just pull down, and just cut it off like that, and you can just, now you can take this part here, Cut that off, and you don't have to get an individual tubers like we're trying to do here that we would normally do that you would use to get that we would sell to try to plant and go to do that. You can plant, and you can discard the rest or give it to somebody else if you want to do that, pass it around and do that. So it's actually really easy. That's the kind of bull in the china shop way of doing it. But uh, the other way you can, when, and I, I do this when it's been sitting a while. This has been sitting a while, so it'll dry out and it'll kind of separate itself and act as a puzzle. How long does a cluster like that last before it has to be planted? Um, I, we dig here in, well, I dig January or so to do that. But you can dig them, a lot of people have to dig them in October, in the freezes area. Store them, put them in there, and then you can plant them in June. Would you more than a year than no, because what they'll do is they'll start, they'll, they'll think I have to grow and I've had stuff where I've left over to do that and you go out in the storage thing and you see, you know, you got a piece that long where it tried to grow and it died. Because when they first start, the reason why you don't have to water them and everything, doing it, all the nutrition, everything they need is inside this tuber. <laughs> That's why they have a high sugar content. It's the energy for the plant to grow to do that. So once that gets done, it gets to the point, it'll start shriveling up and dying and doing that thing. And it, yeah, I've had them, I've had tubers where I had a year where they didn't shrivel up, they didn't do it in the store, I, in where I store them at. Um, it's, the temperature was right and everything right was fine, but I tried to grow and it wouldn't grow to do that. So it's pretty much, it, was, it was meant it was never going to grow even at that time to do that. So that is how you, you take these big tuber clumps that you have to do that, and then we just clean them up. And we just clean up the bottom of these tails here to do that. Anything that's kind of broken, that's, that's all wiggly and stuff that's not going to do any good, I just, just cut those off, get them out of the way. And you have a nice little clean guy right there. You can do that. So you, can, you don't have to go through all the effort of getting down there. The important part when you're doing the dahlias is that you always want to have the crown on there, which is actually part of the stock. That's where it's coming from. 
Uh, it could be one year we had it in the fairgrounds, somebody dug them all up, thought they would be nice and divided them and said, look at all these beautiful dahlia tubers we had and they looked like potatoes because they just cut everything off in the necks and it was gone. So <laughs> <laughs> they don't have eyes everywhere growing the thing. The eyes are always going to be on the stalk end, the crown end. You'll see a little knob on there to do that to see. But this is a little bit easier to work. This is a one year. This is a, one of the open centers. This here is a, uh, an orchid that I have. And I'll get my glasses so I can see because I have a number on this. So when you go to divide them and you get them done, the things you need here is always make sure you have a sharpener, you have your knife. Now that I've done this, oops, I will get down, step on the phone on the floor. Uh, one thing I make sure to do when I go on a clump, the clump to do this same thing is I always make sure I sterilize it. You can use a bleach solution, a 10% bleach solution with one, like one part water to 10 parts, I mean, 10 parts water with one part bleach, four rocks to do it. I like using this because it kills everything. You don't have to do it real fast and I get it done quick and it just, I always make sure I burn that part off. Pretty much get to the point where I make sure there's no organic matter on there, no um, and no moisture, so it's all going to be done. So it's like, okay, now you don't want to plunge into your next one right away. To do it. <laughs> so what I would do, so I take this, and set it aside, and grab my other knife to do that. But I didn't bring two knives in tonight to do that. So if it gets that way and do that thing, what I would do is take. I'm going to wait for it to cool off. I would plunge this knife into the mother tuber of the one that you're dividing and that'll cool it off real quick to do it. But it's always good to have two sets of knives to do that. And I do the same thing when I do in cuttings. When I make cuttings, I have three or four blades. I sterilize between each one, move it on, so I make sure I don't spread any viruses or diseases and do that. So now, well, it didn't burn me, so we'll get this done here. Don't look here. You cheat, do this, and cover it up with some water. There you go. This is your water bottle. <laughs> <laughs> so, when you get this here, and I, I, you can see his here to do this, we have, we're coming out, this is our, our main stalk is coming up, this is where our flower came up from this season to do that. So, Right here, if you look inside here and see this, we're coming up right in here. And if I can get to, let me, see, let me get this real quick. I have a picture here. I could have did this at the break. I apologize for that. Speed readers, go for it. <laughs> Okay, so what I'm looking at here, this thing, is I'm looking at, and this is where the stock came up from last year to do this. So what I'm going to do is right in this, this, the center, and this is one thing when you cut your tubers, what you want to do when you get them ready for the end of the year, you want to cut these about 18 inches or so above the ground. So where your bottom, bottom set of leaves were, cut it right just above that, because you can see it's hollow. If you cut these right down to the ground, you have little buddies in the ground. You have your slugs or your sow bugs, and everybody be hiding inside there, ready to go take in, to go spread around, the day, and they will eat through the inside of your thing and rot your crown. Or water will get in there, it will freeze in there to do that. When we have a quick little freeze at night here, do we have, you know, like it never snows on a beach, right? <laughs> uh, a couple of years, I told that story to somebody, thought it was crazy, the next day it snowed, and I didn't know. So, uh, so it'll, it'll freeze inside there and, and it'll rot. So we want to get in here, so I'm going to take the knife and I'm going to try to get in here. This is my tuber that I know is no good down here in my mother's tuber. I'm just going to come straight down here and cut that. So just, just take the knife, do not stab yourself. And experience and just get it inside the hole and down here, get down here, go right in between. And now we have two sets of here to do this. So the next thing I would do is I'm going to look at this here and I'm going to find my eyes right here. This one here, you see this one, how this is, at, and it's because it's peeled off and then this is one that was left a little bit too long to do that. That's not going to give me anything. 
let's see how this has a crown here. This has a crown here. It's attached to it. Take them apart and stand. I, I that will nine times out of ten will definitely give up. This is definitely going to give some because that is an eye there. That one I would just cut that off and get out of my way so I don't have to work with it. So I'm going to look in here and I see my eyes inside here and I'll just take my little clippers or a nice to do it. I like when I get to this point to get some sharp ones to do this and get in here to do the fine work and just straight through. And now you have two tubers here to do that. Uh, if I paid attention and do it right, I could probably get about eight or nine out of this grump here, but it depends on what you, how you want to do it. And it was one that I knew I didn't really care for to do that much. Now this one here, you look at it and we're kind of seeing, we can't really see any distinction between them sometimes. So you can leave it like this and plant this and it'd be just fine. A lot of times in between, in between when you get them together like this, they'll kind of have like a natural line inside there where you see them grow and you'll see the light color and then the dark line. And if you take them right in, in this one here, you can see where they're growing up and do this. And I would cut right between that line and split it off. So if you pass those, you can take a look at it and see it. It's a little challenge to see it, but you can kind of see the natural mark. And that's where I would divide it here. So that is pretty much how you divide them. It's easy to do to get it done. Um, and right now is a good time of year to do it. It's in the ground to get it done. It's like, oh, it's too late to pass. It's actually easier now because when you bring them up, they'll already have eyes starting to grow that you can see, you won't be guessing. So you can just take a hacksaw. And I, there's, there's, there's a guy that comes to our society, he divides with a bandsaw. So, that's scary. I, have, I stab myself all the time with this, the oyster knife, so I don't need to have a bandsaw in my hand. So you, you can take that, you can you take them and, and whatever size blade that you have, you can cut it, you can get everything out of your way to make your life so you don't break the necks. The, the main thing is, is that when you do do this, is that you want to be careful of these necks. The smaller ones you don't want to break because if this neck breaks on there, it's not going to grow because you just it basically cut off the string from it to get out of the, the, all the energy. Um, and the other thing you do is when you first dig them up, wash them off so you get them clean. If you wash them when you first dig them out, the skin's still pretty tough. So you can do it. If you let them sit, then you're going to have to let them sit a little while so they can get a crust here on it. So they get almost like a potato type texture to them to do that. You know, hard enough. When you do divide them, there's a couple ways you can do it. If it's dry like this, I get sharpies. I'm going to take these sharpies here, the things, um, and I would, you get the ones, this one was for the thing, but I, you get the, with the red writing on it, it's the industrial, the industrial strength one, so it's less, or now they have it says less fadeable to do that, so more resistant to fade. Um, Another one I do is, is I have another Sharpie and it's a paint tip. So I don't have to worry about tearing my skin if it's doing that to do this. So you can see. So it's, I have it for wherever point I'm at. I've done it, gone up and cutting tubers for four hours, go have lunch, you know, like and then I move to the paint one because I don't, don't want to tear. They got to the point where it's it very tender to do that. And that will cause rot. If, you, if it pulls up too much, it'll cause rot and it'll turn blacking. So any of the tubers have any black on the, the, the on the tuber itself, you want to get rid of it, and no one have an extra on the stem. The other thing, more difficult to find, they're not as good as they used to be. Swan Island sells these to do that, and they're grease pencils. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's just when you first get them and you wash the tubers and they're wet, dry them off so it's just slightly damp, and then you just write on there and you can write the names. I use number codes and I have a, a list of all my numbers so I know which one they are. It's better than trying to write, you know big old name across the little tiny tubers. It's always the small tubers <laughs> that had big names. Uh, another thing that you can do is you can tell is the traits. It's kind of like, a, like a, a, the tubers for varieties, you will learn what they are. They will have tendencies you can figure out. But one big trait that you see in tubers is thing everybody says, well, that big clump there, that must be a giant bloom. But, well, no, it's usually the small bloom because it's trying to put so much effort to make that 14 inch bloom and you get down and you have a little tuber thing that's about like this and you're like how did that happen see to do that because all the energy is going to the plant some larger varieties will do that 
That's the other thing we try to do. I try to do in hybridization is I have tests. Not only do I test them for they come up that I like the way they look, they have the form I want to do it, but how well do they store? Some you just can't store. You have to work that hard for them. And like Buddy said, you don't melee hot them. So if they're not going to do it, they're not going to store it. It takes a lot of effort to store. They don't produce good tubers that will last. That's why part of that 10,000 disappeared because I didn't like the way they stored it and store well to do that. So it will, it will tell you a lot about the things. Uh, one, a palm. So we have a palm called Moore Place. It has a tuber cup that's about that big. And they're all like this. And you got 50 tubers on them and you cut them all up and you have four. You're done because they're all, this, they're all doing this. So that's why if you have them to the point where they're like this, this time of year even, that the, your stock is going to be starting to rot a little bit. So it'll just, it'll come apart really easy. Just work it just like a puzzle, whittle it apart, do that and get it to a point. Or just hack away at it if you see it. If you only want a couple to put it in a plant, so you do that or you can pass it on. So pretty much that's it. Easy to do in this vitamin. Get ready to do that. Um, the planting time comes up. We say we can do pot. Use a good quality potting mix to mix your pots. Let's see, so any other questions you have on that stuff? No questions? Yes? How often do you recommend digging them up? How often do you recommend digging them up? If you just grow them for your garden, gardening, for to do that just for your garden, I would recommend you every other year. Every other year. And it's just for the health of the plant. Because you see, this one I dug up right here, even this one here, this is only two years. So the second year, all its buddies that came off that one tuber is going to start sending them shoots. Uh, with the old water we have here, do you find that you need to mound these? I have mine in raised beds. I think raised beds help. Just the fact that it also warms the soil. Mm -hmm. The sides warm the soil to do that. Um, I also live on the river. And uh, the first year the river flooded, I was out digging tubers in two feet of water because I was mm -hmm. afraid they were going to all rot. But the soil dried out and drained real well. I didn't have any more losses than I did before. So raised beds themselves, if, even if you just crown them a bit, it gives you more surface area to heat up, more surface area for oxygen and energy to get into them. And then they'll, they'll kind of control themselves to stay within that, that little thing too. Oh, that's good. Well, I appreciate you coming. And, and oh, one more question. Uh, as far as pinching? Yes. Okay, well, you do have stopping and stuff, and that, that's things we can do. And what she's talking about pinching is you stop them up, and when they get to a certain point, depending on the variety, you, you stop them at the top. So you, you've been waiting to see a big bloom and show up. You have to pinch that on off, because then what it's doing is what happens when you pinch this, pinch this off here. This is ready to pinch pretty soon. It'll make this, the stock get thicker. And then every set of leaf notes come up, we're going to be standing up so the pies will get bushier to do that. So definitely. Okay, so I, I have a, a few plants that haven't been dug up, so there's lots of tubers. And so when they do come up, there's lots of branches. Do I need to pinch all of them, all the branches? Uh, yeah, if you, if you have them that way, yeah, you're going you're gonna to stop. It's, like a, it's more like a bush. But what I, what I would do in, in that particular case, even if you leave them in the ground, is start cutting those off all together and doing that. You just need one stem to give you a big bushy plant. So one stalk coming up, we'll, okay. all those stems will do that. Oh, wow. And all these start, these, these plants we have here, I have them up to this tall and they're that wide and it's all coming off of one stalk to do that. So you're, you're, helping, you're helping all the, the other ones not rob the energy of the one you got. So pick the best one, cut the rest back, and leave two or three if you want to do that and make a push it. I planted one tuber last year and we ended up with four huge stalks coming out of that one tuber uh -huh. the summer. Um, should I have allowed that to happen or should I stop those? Uh, you, those? I, if it comes up, I would cut a couple of them off and a couple of them grow to do that. Just, it just really depends what you want to do. Uh, I, I would say <coughs> at most, uh, if it was just me just doing a garden, knowing what I know about them, it would be just three at the most to do that. Because mm -hmm. um, you're once again, you're trying to not you know, stress out your plant down below because it will stress them out. But some of these will shoot out multiple eyes at the same time, even on one stem, as you saw in that one that we had in there. So you just break them off and stop them. Good?
Well, we said we're available, we contact, you got the, you have the contact information, contact the library and see, and we can do that. And then I can, anytime you have any questions, you can do that. But I show, we'd love to try to see it. Uh, we have membership forms in the back, and we're having some giveaway with when you get a membership, the paid membership to do that. And you can just, you can go the full membership, which gives you the other thing, or you can just get the local membership. That helps us raise money so we can put the show on and do that. We can and we can use, even if you're not an exhibitor, we can use volunteers to help out to try because we get about 300 visitors to the show and we do have people from Portland down to San Francisco coming up to exhibit. Where and when are your meetings? The meetings we have on the second Friday of the month. We have the second Friday of the month at the Lutheran Church and up on top they have on the main building where the church is at. Mm -hmm. They have a, 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 this will be Friday evenings at six o'clock, and we, we we do that so we get people time to, to get up and, and make it. Uh, we've moved it around all kinds of times. We had it on Saturday, and when the weather got good, there was a long gardening. <laughs> so Friday evening sounds like the second Friday works. We do that, try to get it done. Um, and Tim was nice enough to I was at looking for a place. I was doing a job at his place one time, and he had a pasture and was going to plant down this pasture to do it because I've always looked for a place to grow more plants. For some reason I got a problem. <laughs> and they were store having horses were going to stay in there so he offered us to use the back of the church. It was a place that wasn't getting done. Yeah. So we put it in and do that and they used it. And the blooms that we put out there to do that, we have ones that belong to people. We mark them not to do it. But they use them to bring them for services and just helps. It makes everybody feel nice to do it. So it kind of thing. So it was nice of them. I do deeply appreciate the use of the facilities. And it makes it great. Just go up there and take care of it. Cool. Thank you. So that'd be great. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.